former Olympic coach Barry Shepley and today pleased to join you as your personal coach. Over the years he has combined his talents as coach, motivator and businessman to develop the sport of triathlon across the country. He has coached the Canadian national triathlon team since 1991. In 2000, he led the Canadian team to a gold medal performance at the Sydney Olympic Games. It was the debut year for the full medal score, and it was a performance no one will ever forget. His name is Barry Shepley. He has coached over 500 people to national championship titles, Pan American Game medals, world championship medals, as well as successful completion of the Hawaii Ironman and the Boston Marathon. Barry also wears yet another hat as the voice of triathlon as he announces triathlon races all over the world and is a featured commentator for triathlon on the CBC. We'll have a chance to follow some of the best athletes in the world as they go through the HSBC international event. If you're a first time triathlete just beginning, an age group athlete hoping to make your national team Barry uses the stories from his own remarkable odyssey to provide training and motivational advice to help his audience learn how they too can achieve their personal best. Join me, Diana Bumbaca, as I talk one-on-one -on -one with Barry Shapley right after this break. Welcome to One on One, I'm Diana Bumbaka. Joining me today is one of Canada's most prominent uh, triathletes and triathlon coaches, Barry Shepley. Thank you for joining me today, Barry. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. Now, Barry, you come from a family with no real sporting background. How did you get into triathlon? Well, I talk about uh, having a bowler's body and a high performance brain. And uh, when I was a young athlete, I had lots of little trophies from a town without a stoplight. So it's important that you realize how small you know, that is. And when I got to university, I clearly remember watching uh, the 84 Olympic Games. And lots of your listeners, I'm sure, can remember Alex Bauman, this incredible swimmer uh, from Sudbury, Ontario. And I was working in Chrysler's making minivans as a summer university student. And when I saw him win that gold medal, there was just turned on some kind of an excitement to see thousands of people in a factory who didn't know each other cheering because of one thing, and that was that a Canadian was on top of the podium and, and decided that I wanted to, to be awesome in sport. And within a couple of weeks, got cut by three varsity teams at McMaster University. So all those little trophies from a small town didn't mean a lot. Uh, and quickly, I started to put my energy into coaching, and it was the best decision I ever made. Now, as I said earlier, you were a triathlete yourself. So tell me about your first triathlon. Interestingly, I'd watched this Hawaii Ironman thing on television just weeks before and decided that I was going to sign up for a, a race up in Sarnia. Uh, and a week before, I took my very first swim lesson, and I could not put my face into the water. I was terrified. So I would swim as far as I could with one breath, bring my head up, start to gasp, and so forth. So my lifeguard uh, friend said, look, there's no chance you're going to make a mile swim doing that. So she taught me something called pick an apple, put it in the basket, which was side stroke. And I get down to Lake Huron. There was three-foot waves. Uh, and I'd already paid my $30 entry fee, so there's no way I was going to drop out. And uh, 39 minutes later, I was the last guy out of the lake, so it wasn't a glorious start. Uh, but I was enjoying just seeing all these people trying something that maybe they weren't very good at. It was active. There was variety. You weren't just doing running all the time or swimming all the time. So the, the variety caught on for me, and then I suddenly had an opportunity in a sport that there was nobody coaching, and that's how I really got started. Now, earlier you mentioned that you were going to McMaster University, but when you first attended McMaster, you started with engineering. How did you go from engineering to what you're doing now? Well, you know, often in, in high school, and I'm sure there's lots of uh, the kids watching who, you know, they're trying to decide what are they going to do with their life. And I had high math and science marks, and my, uh, my teacher suggested engineering because of that kind of a science background. Got to McMaster, and I was spending my limited amount of time I had, because you can appreciate how tough first-year engineering is, reading my roommate's anatomy textbooks. And I said, if I'm spending my spare time reading the books that this guy is supposed to read for his course, clearly I'm in the wrong program. So I went and spoke to the dean at Christmas, 
Uh, they said if you make sure you keep your average up, we'll let you transfer into kinesiology uh, next year. And it was the greatest move I made because uh, I think you need to follow a passion. And I wasn't passionate for, for the numbers that engineering was, but I was passionate for sort of what can the human body do and talking about physiology and understanding anatomy and how to make a muscle stronger or somebody jog a little bit faster. Now, while you were in university, how did you get more involved in triathlons? Very interesting. There's an ama amazing guy named Frank Hayden who uh, some of your listeners will know. He was the guy who started the Special Olympics. And Frank lived in Oakville, was a professor at McMaster University. And I was trying to get information about a local triathlon. And I called the sport offices in Ontario and said, I'd like to find out more about uh, how you get started in triathlon. And there wasn't a sport organization. It didn't exist. So at 21 years of age, I started up the Ontario Association of Triathletes out of my residence at McMaster University. Uh, and when you thought you were calling the provincial office, you were calling my residence telephone number. Uh, and within about three years, we had 2,000 people who were registered provincial members uh, and started up a kids program. And that was really the, the really start of the program, this thing called Kids of Steel. And for me, probably maybe the most important thing that we've done in the sport. Tell me a little bit about Kids of Steel. Well, I think every kid is a triathlete. I think they swim all summer, they get on their bike and they ride to the park and they kick a soccer ball around, have a hot dog and, and ride home. So for me, it wasn't that difficult a task to see kids doing this. And I was concerned that the sport I was involved in had all these adults, 40, 50 year olds doing it, but nobody down at the youth level. So I talked about getting a program started. In fact, there was a company in, tr in uh, Toronto called Triathlon Leasing knew nothing about them. I got into their boardroom and after about an hour I convinced the vice president that they should be sponsoring my Kids of Steel series. And the lady was going to sign a check for $100,000. This is 18 years ago and I'm like you know, 20 plus years of age, just getting started. I don't have a car. I had to go into Toronto on the go bus. Uh, but now she wants to see one of the races. So I said there's a race Friday at McMaster University. Got back to McMaster, talked the, uh, the summer school guys into having all their kids in my kids triathlon uh, on Friday and when the vice president from Triathlon Leasing showed up, they saw it, had a great time, signed a check for $100,000 and within a couple of weeks I started putting on kids races across the province. And now it's in uh, all 10 provinces, uh, about 60 races a year and 10,000 kids will do a youth triathlon as young as three and four years of age with water wings and tricycles. Well, that's a great story. When we come back, we're gonna talk more about children being active. If you're watching One on One, please stay with us. There's more after this break. Welcome back to One on One. I'm Diana Bumbaka. Joining me today is Barry Shepley, a triathlete, and he was also a triathlon coach for the Canadian Olympic team in 2000 in Sydney, Australia. But we'll get to that in a second. Just before we went to break, I wanted to ask your opinion on child obesity. It's a hot topic right now. It's always in the news. What's your opinion on how active children should be? Well, you know, for me, it's a big concern, and, and I think it starts at home. And the second problem is at the school system, and certainly not to pick on teachers, but I've spent a lot of time going into schools, and there's just not enough physical activity for kids. Playgrounds are being shut down because they're worried about you know, kids falling off the monkey bars and so forth. And if I take a look back even 20 years ago when I started to coach, I see a big difference in the school system in terms of how heavy kids are at 7 years of age, at 10 years of age. And we know that there's huge issues with health, that it'll probably be the first generation that the kids are fighting with their parents for the medical dollars when they all need it at the same time at the hospital. So for me, it, it's about a lifestyle. And one of the beauties for me about triathlon, but I don't really care what the sport is, it's get kids active and find something that they enjoy. Every kid's not going to be a football player or a hockey player. And if it's tennis, if it's hiking, whatever it is, find something that they're passionate about and get them started. And uh, even though I'm an Olympic coach, I don't really worry about getting kids into high performance. In fact, I, I see some families where they're really spending too much energy to create the next Wayne Gretzky or the next Simon Whitfield, and they never do, and they end up with burnt out kids who really just you know, don't enjoy sport at the end of the day, and that's really not what you want to find. So what in the perfect world would be your solution to solving this problem? Well, I think there's a couple of elements. If we can reduce the cost of just getting into sport, 
there are, are it's, a, it's a real barrier now. Uh, if you play hockey, you probably need a couple thousand dollars between entry fees and, and equipment to play. And there are organizations that are trying to help families that can't afford to get involved in sport. But for me, when I see all the gymnasiums that sit all summer long, most nights, not active, and yet you're worried about 15-year-old kids getting into trouble, open those gymnasiums. Let those kids get active. Go in and play some base, uh, indoor basketball, some indoor hockey, whatever the case may be, because you have to kid, keep kids active. If you don't, they're going to get into trouble. And now with computer games and everything else that goes on, they're m mostly inactive sitting in front of computers and not being physically active. And I know that in many of my friends' cases, you know, they, they drive their kids everywhere. They don't have them walk to the store. They don't have them walk to school. Well, it's all about physical exertion. And if they don't do some physical activity, they're in trouble. And then obviously the other second element is the nutrition side. If they're always eating drive through if they're not uh, you know, eating nutritiously, it's bad habits at 10 and 12. They're going to lead to really bad habits when they're 25 and 30. Now, you have had a lot of experience with high-performance athletes. Being the coach of the Canadian team at the 2000 Sydney Olympics, what was it like when you found out that that was going to be your position? Well, you know, in 1994, triathlon was announced that it was going to get its Olympic debut of all places, and you've been there, to Sydney, Australia. What an incredible city. I don't think there's ever been a country that's done a better job and been, been more motivated to host. They shut down schools for three weeks. And so 94, triathlon got in, uh, but I was finally announced in 98, uh, even though I was the national team coach, I was finally announced in 98 to be going. And for my wife and I, it had been a, probably a 10-year journey of volunteering, of being at training camps, of missed birthdays and suppers and people's weddings. Uh, and so she was sitting in the front row when Simon Whitfield crossed the finishing line for the gold medal. Uh, and it was just an incredible experience, a surreal experience, because literally you have saw it on television, you've dreamed about it. I saw Alex Bauman, and now suddenly here's a Canadian athlete. And Simon was my roommate. We had gone through the whole, you know, marching in, the s opening ceremonies, the whole thing. And then to finally see this young kid who got started in Kids of Steel, just a normal kid from Kingston, Ontario, uh, you know, cross the finishing line, and his life changed immediately. He became a spokesperson. He became identified with the sport. Uh, the next year, Kids of Steel participation doubled just because it was cool because Simon Whitfield had done triathlons. That's an incredible story. Yeah. And as a coach, very rewarding. Well, you know, I, I think uh, some of my experiences, and obviously Simon's, you know, the glamorous one uh, when you're there and you get to see it up close, but uh, I have an 85-year-old uh, who won the World Championships for Canada as an 85-year-old triathlete. And so when you see the whole gamut from the juniors all the way to the age group athletes, for me it's about a lifestyle because each one of those people have different hurdles. The 85-year-old guy has you know, arthritis in his hands and has challenges to get out there. Simon Whitfield, you know, he needed money to buy equipment at 19 and 20 years of age. So each one of those athletes have a different journey to get there. Well, when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about what else you do right now in your spare time. Please stay with us. There's more to come on One on One. Welcome back to One on One. I'm Diana Bumbaka. Joining me today is Barry Shapley. Now, Barry, you own your own health consulting firm called Personal Best. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, really, the company started because we love the name Personal Best. Everybody has a Personal Best. For some person, it's to be able to walk 5K. For another, it's to run it in 15 minutes. So when we started the company, we wanted to create something that would help individual people be healthy, but be able to achieve whatever their potential was. And over a period of 10 or 12 years, we've been able to grow not just into individual health with families, and we work with about six different Olympic teams, but also with corporations. So co companies like Oracle and Hewlett Packard and others, that we actually have a wellness center right in their building. And now we can help the personal best wellness of 1,000 people at General Motors or at Manulife and so forth. So it's great to be able to go in on a daily basis and see my employees changing the habits of a thousand people in a company and at first it might be just how they change what they eat at lunch and maybe you come down once a month for a yoga class or stretching eventually maybe you start to use some weights and so often what happens something in their life has changed maybe they've had a bad medical diagnosis and now they come down to see us so and unlike that sort of preachy area we're there when you're ready to come down and see us and so it's great we've got an incredible world-class employees in the company and now uh, my partner Sheldon Prasad my wife Karen they really run it. I'm involved mostly in the triathlon part of the universe, uh, but, but they've done a fantastic job, and uh, we're, we're always looking to try to change the wellness of a corporation. So what is your main goal beyond just changing the wellness of a corporation? If 
you bring it down to the individuals that you work with. What is your main goal for them? Well, you know, I think that's a very interesting question. And one of the issues is that everybody has a different uh, background and the different obstacles they have. I have some people that come to see me and they're 250 pounds. They're working 75 hours a week and they have four kids and a mortgage. I mean, they have a very different amount of resources than uh, a young 22-year-old athlete who wants to make the NHL or the Olympic Games. And so part of it is trying to be realistic with them. And I talk about a frying pan. Uh, very important that you get the right size frying pan for your situation. If, if you've got all the talent and the resources and the energy, you might need a frying pan this big because you're looking at going to the world or the Olympics or whatever. Uh, if you're trying to just change the wellness of bringing your blood pressure down uh, and getting maybe three 30-minute walks a week, that's just time management. It's almost manageable for anyone to do that. Maybe you do it at lunch hour. Maybe you do it when you drop the kids off to play hockey and you go out for the 45 minutes. So part of it is trying to organize their own personal wellness. And I think what I'm seeing more and more, particularly in the GTA area, people are so busy. They come right from work to pick up kids and drop off and then go take care of parents that just finding the time is the biggest element. So part of it is just saying, you know what, what if we did this? What if we had a little bit of equipment in your basement? What if we had somebody that met you once a week and did a workout with you or a group that you went on hiking with? So it's finding that little bit of an idea that's going to be motivating to them. That's really the biggest issue. Uh, and I think in most cases, people can do that if somebody can give them the roadmap. And uh, when you're so busy, you don't even have time to open the roadmap. So that's one of the things that we're able to do within our company. Now, how do you use your own personal stories to help motivate other individuals? You know, that's a great question. I think one of the benefits for me is that I am extraordinarily average. You know, I, I don't have fast twitch fiber muscles that allow me to sprint, and I don't have the ability to run a marathon in two and a half hours. So when people see that I've finished marathons, and in fact, uh, uh, we were talking off the air, but I, had a, I was 16 years of age and ran my very first marathon. Uh, should never have been allowed to run a marathon that young. And I was running along, and the second mistake I made was I was wearing headphones, those big headphones that they tell you not to wear. Well, I'm in Philadelphia running down the road, 6,000 people, and a stolen motorcycle came out of a 7-Eleven, ran me over, ended up fracturing my hip, and I ran the last, got back up, ran the last eight or nine miles, and, and I had about two years of injuries that came out of that. So when people realize that you can overcome obstacles, I now have athletes who are blind that have done marathons, I have athletes who are missing a leg, an arm. And when, when you show their story to somebody, say, I can't run 5K, and they see this 80-year-old guy or a blind athlete, and they've done these things, they say, you know what, maybe I could go you know, out and power walk three nights a week, or maybe I could get some weights for the basement and take some self-responsibility. So really, it's about telling the stories of normal people who have had to overcome obstacles, who do have the same problems of not enough money and not enough time and knees that are sore, all the things that most of us have, and you see that they're doing those things, you start to say, well, maybe I could just change my life just a little bit. Well, when we come back, Barry, I'm going to ask you about who has motivated or inspired you. Please stay with us. There's more to come on One on One. Welcome back to One on One. Joining me is Barry Shepley. Now, Barry, just before we headed to break, I said that you were a motivational speaker and that you might have somebody that inspires you. So who is it that motivates you? Well, you know, I think most people are impacted by a, a spectrum of people. And certainly the first motivating person for me was, was my mother, who uh, didn't have high school education, who uh, had to struggle in a family of 11 or 12. And she was always looking for a better opportunity for my sister and I. And watching how she sacrificed uh, right up until passing away from ovarian cancer a couple of years ago. Uh, and her final wishes were, you know, that my sister and I would be happy and that we'd be able to make an impact in the world. So no question that I think often your role models start at home, hopefully, and that was a phenomenal one for me. Uh, the other person that continues to inspire me uh, is my wife, who has done thankless jobs for the last 15 years behind the scenes so that I could go to the Olympic Games, so that I could actually be away for a whole year. I had to go to Victoria, British Columbia to become uh, certified as a level 4-5 coach in Canada to go to the Olympic Games. She stayed, paid the bills, you know, kept the lights on, etc. And those are the kinds of people that believe in you. Uh, and then as you start to look around your next circle of friends, my business partner Sheldon has you know, always been there. So those kinds of people, when they believe in you, you have that confidence to go out and make a difference in the world because you know you got a team that when you fail, they're going to be there to help you get back up. And, and I think that's one of the things I try to do with groups that I work with. 
to get them to believe in each other. So a team's got to believe in each other. There can only be one guy who puts all the pucks in the net or all the balls for the hoop, but you've got to support each other. That guy never gets the puck or the ball to put it into the hoop or the net. Now, you've been a part of a team for most of your life, so what characteristics do you think team building plays in an individual? Well, you know, I, I think it's critical, and, and you can see a difference between team athletes and individual athletes. Individual athletes, people who maybe run or play tennis or golf, uh, they're very driven for excellence, and they only have to depend on themselves. When you get into a team situation, well, I need four other people, six other people, depending on the size of what the team is, to all be interacting and doing the same thing and taking different roles. So you start to see personalities come out, and some people aren't uh, you know, really set up to be a team player on a team. Other individuals would rather just drive themselves in an individual sport, whether it's a cross-country skier or a mountain biker, that kind of thing, because now hard work pays off for them, whereas if I work really hard on a team and two or three others aren't showing up for practice, they get frustrated because I'm committed and they're not. But I think if you take a look in general, there's some great skills that team sports can give you, and that is you know, a goal. We all have to strive to get towards that goal. And if we're not working collectively, we're not going to get there. And I see it in businesses that I work in. I see it in families. Uh, if you don't have that sort of support dynamics, you're going to have some chaos and some problems. What characteristic do you think uh, any athlete needs, or maybe not even an athlete, somebody who's doing amateur sport, to be dedicated to that sport? What is the main characteristic for them? Very first, most important one is fun and passion. If, if you know, Wayne Gretzky just loved to hit a puck and go out with his skates on for hours in his backyard. His parents didn't have to make him do that. Maybe his dad built him a little rink, but Wayne had to be the person that wanted to go out there. Steve Nash, who I met at the Olympic Games, had to go into the gym in Little Victoria and shoot thousands of balls when nobody knew that this little Canadian kid would become a two-time NBA All-Star. So I think it first and foremost, it's got to be fun, it's got to be passion, and then you need a little bit of luck. You need to get surrounded by maybe a coach or a club or a community that understands what you're about, and they're going to keep the gymnasium open on weekends so you can get in and play some volleyball or basketball, et cetera. And that's a little bit of luck. And so one of the things that I've now spent lots of my time in the last four or five years is trying to create environments for kids and for adults, but mostly for kids to get started, that we keep pools open, that we pay for some time at a track for some kids to come in, that I go to a grade school and do a little clinic for kids because if they get that spark at the right time, it's amazing what can happen. Now you've had a very successful career. Out of all your accomplishments and awards, what would you say is the most important to you? Ah, that's a good question. I think probably being inducted into the Hall of Fame might have been the most rewarding because it's not about one day, it's about thousands of days and thousands of sacrifices and hundreds of athletes who've had successes from the Olympics to the world to the Pan American Games, etc. Uh, and I think maybe if I blended that, the second element would be looking at uh, the creation of the C3 Canadian Cross Training Club, which is right here in you know, your viewers' area. We've got a club that, that is world class, and it gets people started from, I just want to do my first little 5K, to I'd love my kids start to mountain bike or to run or to do a triathlon. And I know that that's going to pay its rewards down the road as kids are staying active, as families are getting more active. And if we get one more little Simon Whitfield in 10 or 15 years out of the world, you know, out of that group, well, that's great. But that's really not what its priority was. What do you enjoy about living in this region? You know, it, my friends from around the world come here. And first of all, they can't believe of how big Ontario is. Secondly, they can't believe all, you know, from the quarries to the open water areas to the green spaces that we have to run in. Uh, it's world class to be that close to get to the Toronto airport to fly where I have to go out, you know, four or five times a month. Uh, I've got everything. I can be in the green space when I want to be in the green space, and in 45 minutes I can be on an airplane flying out of Ontario to an event, and I don't think you could match that any place in the world. Well, Barry, I just wanted to say thank you very much for joining me today. We had a wonderful conversation. Thank you for watching One on One. I'm Diana Bumbaca.